Um, thanks, Mr Acting Deputy President. Look, I um, am pleased to uh, take part in this debate as a Western Australian senator, and I certainly look forward to defeating the bill when it finally comes to a vote, because this, I think, is a great example of why you can do opposition by slogan, as Prime Minister, then Opposition Leader Tony Abbott, was so adept at doing, and what a disaster it is when you try governing by slogan. The whole stop the boats, axe the tax rhetoric that carried the Prime Minister into office now poses a real and present threat to the budget, bottom line. There's a real sense of irony, I suppose, having just heard um, Senator Helen Polly, now my Tasmanian colleague, uh, speak about the evils of the mining industry and how it's so important to stick up for them. If only you had, if only you hadn't allowed the mining companies to rewrite the mining tax so that it would collect no actual revenue. Um, having heard this, uh, these mining tax bills described in recent weeks as among the worst pieces of public policy that we've ever seen, I find it hard to disagree. Um, because effectively the bills were amended to the point where they were unrecognisable from the model that former Treasury Secretary Ken Henry put forward, um, leaving us with the shell of a bill that effectively bought the Labor Party all of the pain and none of the gain. You, know, you copped a brutal attack, and there's no two ways about it. A $22 million advertising campaign paid for by, among others, the Minerals Council, um, the determined advocacy of Mitch Hook and his allies, and it saved the companies, um, again by Treasury estimates, roughly $160 billion when Prime Minister Julia Gillard, after um, Mr Rudd was deposed, sat down um, under the, the crafty authorship of who better than Martin Ferguson to sit down with the big three miners to rewrite their own tax law. I wish I could rewrite my own tax law. I'd end up paying a lot less tax, but fortunately the law of the land isn't written that way. But when you get Martin Ferguson and the big three mining companies to sit down and write tax codes to suit themselves, they realised a return of investment of about uh, 730,000% per cent on their $22 million advertising campaign. Now, I felt a bit sorry for the Labor Party stepping up, um, as they did, to apply a, a fair tax regime on an industry that, when it reached a certain threshold of super profits, some would come off the top and go back to the taxpayer. And as a Western Australian, I pay very close attention to that kind of public policy because our state government, the Barnett government, has managed to blow away a AAA credit rating in the middle of the greatest commodities boom that our state's ever seen and can't afford to put public transport in anymore, can't afford affordable housing, can't afford to keep schools open. So the idea that we could take a sector that is doing as well as the big end of the mining industry, not the small players, those junior and mid-tier explorers or those who are doing it hard would not be affected uh, by the mining super profits tax that was known at the time because, of course, they're not generating super profits. The whole idea of this tax is that it doesn't kick in until you're doing very, very well. And for that $22 million ad campaign, we saw what happened. A prime minister was rolled out of office, a new one came into office and immediately deputised Martin Ferguson to sit down and rewrite the tax law. And then we have a tax that, although it has admittedly very high uh, compliance costs, and there's one um, element of the, uh, of the industry's reading of this that I'm um, inclined to agree with, is that you're paying huge compliance costs in order to fill out the paperwork for a tax measure that collects almost nothing. And uh, we knew, I guess, the fix was in at the time that the Labor Party had the, the tax rewritten, that we could either move the amendments, and we moved a number in the Senate debates at the time um, with Senator Bob Brown, that we were put in a position where we could either accept a tax that was fundamentally broken and would collect very little revenue, or vote with the coalition and collect nothing at all. And that, I think, is one of the great public policy rip-offs of the Australian public in modern history. We wrote a tax, the industry wrote a tax that they knew they would never have to pay. And that's why, even though um, 
Prime Minister Abbott, on his fly-in, fly-out mission into Perth last week, said uh, this is going to be a referendum on the mining tax. There's no ads on TV. There's no riots in the streets. There's no public demonstrations. It's nothing because the tax doesn't work. And in fact, if the tax had worked, we might have been able to afford the light rail project by now. We might have got the Fiona Stanley Hospital actually have some patients in it. We might not be attacking state school teachers and threatening uh, the education of Western Australian kids. The fact is the mining industry is 80 per cent foreign owned. And you'll no doubt have seen, senators will no doubt have seen Mr Ross Gittins in the press um, commenting on the fact uh, that this is just a, effectively a betrayal. And what he said this morning about the repeal of the mineral resources rent tax is as follows. For income earned by an industry to generate jobs in Australia, it has to be spent in Australia. And our mining industry is about 80 per cent foreign owned. Got the message yet? For our economy and our workers to benefit adequately from the exploitation of our natural endowment by mainly foreign companies, our government has to ensure it gets a fair whack of the economic rents those foreigners generate. Long before then, however, Tony Abbott will have rewarded the Liberal Party's foreign donors by abolishing the tax. This will be an act of major fiscal vandalism, of little or no benefit to the economy and at great cost to job creation. And that's why I'm pleased to stand here today and lend my vote in opposition to the Liberal Party's act of major fiscal vandalism, that you can't march around the landscape demanding cuts to health care, cuts to education, cuts to the ABC, cuts to disability support, while at the same time abolishing tax measures that raise you revenue. If Senator Fifield and Senator Back had come in here, or Senator Cormann, when he wants to come out of his office and debate this issue, had proposed amendments to this bill, including some of those that the Greens put when this was last debated, why don't we raise the rate back to 40 per cent? Why don't we cover commodities like gold? Why don't we cover commodities like uranium? Why don't we actually uh, impose a tax on the super profits, most of them which leave the country and leave the economy, so that we can stand down this aggressive cuts agenda that you've brought to the national debate. But you can't have it both ways. You can't be proposing to axe revenue measures or not improve the revenue measures that are clearly here on the table and at the same time uh, be threatening cuts right across the board, across all portfolios. That is the act of major fiscal vandalism by which you stand condemned today. In Western Australia, I don't think the by-election is going to be a referendum on the mining tax. In fact, I think something very different is going on, which is why we're not seeing the sort of screamy attack ads um, that were running that um, so terrified the Labor Party into submission. I think what we have here is Liberal Party advocacy on behalf of politically powerful major donors masquerading as public policy. And you got away with it last year, and power to you. But it doesn't work so well when you're on the Treasury benches and need to balance the books. I challenge Liberal senators from Western Australia in this place to a debate on the economy in Western Australia before West Australians cast their votes on the 5th of April. Let's have the debate about jobs. Do you really think that as the mining boom tapers off and that we move from the construction phase into an operations phase, which is driving one of the factors behind uh, rising unemployment in Western Australia, that all you need to do is simply repeat mining industry slogans in order to win a by-election. Western Australians are a little more politically astute and sophisticated than that. I challenge West Australian senators. Senator Back, you're here today. You're not up for re-election, but maybe you might have a quiet word to your colleagues. If you're so proud of your economic record, of abolishing taxes while proposing cuts, then let's put these views to the people of Western Australia before April 5. On a level playing field, you, you choose the time and the place. Let's have a debate on jobs and the economy. On the weekend, the member for Melbourne, Adam Bant, and I launched the jobs policy for Western Australia. And mining's no doubt going to re remain an important part of the Western Australian economy. And in fact, as long as you can put up a wind turbine, containing two or three hundred tonnes of steel and other metals, mining will remain an important part of the economy. 
But the fact is, it's a small section of the West Australian employment base, and we cannot rely on it in the deeply uncertain age into which we're moving, the age of climate change, in the age of peak oil. We cannot continue to rely on extractive industries and mining to provide a stable employment base, particularly given the, ex the enormous risks that were exposed to in world commodity markets. And we saw last week the iron ore price take a big tumble, and that again sent nervous jitters through the Western Australian economy. So what is your plan? The jobs plan that uh, Mr Bant and I launched talked about the huge jobs potential in renewable energy. Up to 26,000 jobs forecast in the Energy 2029 plan to take Western Australia to a mature, a mature renewable energy economy. But it's not just clean energy or what you might traditionally consider to be a green job. Mind you, these are blue-collar jobs. This is kids in Welshpool and Kalgoorlie welding heliostats. It's not anything particularly esoteric. 26,000. But what about housing? What about housing and construction in affordable, innovative, modular uh, prefab housing? We have a housing affordability crisis, a skilled manufacturing crisis. Uh, we have a crisis in southwest timber towns where uh, native forests are becoming rarer and rarer, running out of 400-year-old trees to cut down. We need to put a stable employment base under those towns. What about the affordable housing industry? That is a very, very jobs-rich agenda. What about agriculture and horticulture? What about telecommunications as you're going about dismantling the end-to-end -end fibre national broadband network? We've launched our jobs plan. Let's see yours. We call on coalition senators next time Mr Rabbit's in town to maybe do a little bit more than just call a press conference uh, and then put himself back on the plane. Let's see your economic and your jobs plan for WA, if you have one. And let's bring this matter of this vote very swiftly to a conclusion, because this is pantomime. We know why this is happening. If you come in here with amendments to improve the revenue gathering measures, maybe take us back towards the original Treasury model that would only have kicked in once the industry was generating enormous profits, then let's have a debate. Then let's debate amendments. Let's do that. But this, at the moment, is an attempt to govern by slogan. And like so many other areas of public policy into which you've blundered, it's something of a disaster. And I look forward to putting this measure to the vote.